We are going to be in Acts chapter 8. Uh, for the remaining weeks of the summer, I just have what I'm calling just selections. <laughs> Random selections, things that I'm, that I'm thinking about and caring about, and so um, I'm going to share those with you, and that'll be fun. Next week, of course, Teen Challenge is here, but we have through the month of August, and we'll kind of bounce around a little bit. But today we're going to be in Acts chapter 8, and <clears throat> this represents... Uh, really some thought about the gospel and the powerful nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he is powerful, that he is above all. And that we believe the good news of Jesus Christ and when we do, that our life is changed. You know, it's easy to underestimate this or maybe to forget about this because we know, if we've been to church, we know Jesus saves, he sets people free, he forgives sins, we see him cast out demons in the scriptures and, and we believe those things and yet our own life, we come before him with our own needs and we feel discouraged, defeated. At one moment, I can pray for the work around the world and be really bold about my prayers for the people there and the next moment feel very worried and stressed out in my own life. And I'm sure you feel the same way, right? Conflict that comes in our own spirit we know these things, but can we apply that to something that we're going through? Does the gospel apply to me like it does to others? What does it look like? So, Book of Acts, chapter 8, amazing stories all over the Book of Acts of the power of the gospel and lives that are dramatically changed, supernaturally redirected because Jesus Christ has come into their life and given them new life. We see that all over the place. The gospel being transformative and that it will change you, it will change me. It, it doesn't leave us the same. The gospel moves into our lives and we live in this worldly life and we kind of push, pushes us towards Jesus to be more like him and he's at work in lives today, right here, in your life, right now. So how is it going for you? And that's our question, right? How, how is it going for you? How do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus clearly? Do you, do you love him? Acts chapter 8 is at the heels of persecution. Uh, Stephen, remember Stephen, if you want to read through that at some point, you can. Stephen uh, was martyred. The church was kind of scattered. We have a guy named Philip from Jerusalem who's going and preaching the gospel. And Miracles are happening. There's something different about this guy, Philip, who's out working and, and sharing Jesus because he is not just doing work and kind of creating a scene. He is pointing people to Jesus Christ. The life of Jesus is pouring out of him in such a way that people were being saved unto life, it says. And this is happening in a place called Samaria. Samaria was a place that, for the Jews, was looked at as a little, um, what's the word, mongrels, <laughs> half-breeds. They had intermarried with non-Jews, and so they were considered to be traitors, and just, they weren't to be dealt with. And so the Jews did not have dealings with them, but Philip went to Samaria, preached Christ, and people responded. So there we are, Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 9. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was something, someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw 
that the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands of the apostles. He offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said will happen. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John turned to Jerusalem, preached the gospel in many Samaritan villages. The gospel is unlike anything else people have seen or heard. And they know this difference because Simon and Philip uh, of their experience. Well, first of all, we see this. The gospel is relevant enough and powerful enough to make Jesus known. Simon, we see him in this text relying on himself, boasting in himself. Simon was into this divination and astrology. He had this supernatural kind of work going on, but he was looked at as powerful. A lot of manipulation, a lot of influence, amazing and dazzling people and all those kinds of things. In verse 10 it says people were giving him all this attention and he, they assumed he was great. He was doing all kinds of really cool things. The problem was it was all an act. Imagine the stress that puts on <laughs> to perform over and over and over again this production that needs to take place in order for people to continue to come and to give him money and to give him you know, fame and all those kinds of things that come with that. Simon had an image. He de delivered this dazzling display, and he had to keep doing it or else people would move on to something else. And he managed for quite a while. We see that he had people following him. It's a lot like entertainment today, right? It's, it's pretty much what we see in the entertainment world. Cool special effects, interesting comedy routines. TV shows have changed dramatically over the years to be very different than what they were. I... You know, back in the 70s, there was a show called Emergency. You know, of course, I'm, I, and uh, a medical drama back in the day that actually was a little more accurate than the ones we see today. But nonetheless, very different. The way the cameras are, the way the effects are, the way the sounds are. Everything is, is changing and constantly changes. People stay interested in it. Today, we see popular musicians steering what people think or, or say or do by the way they dress or what they believe in and what they say, they use influence to dazzle and to create a sense of worship. We give our money, our attention, our devotion to things that are entertaining us. They have opinions and preferences. Without the life of Christ in us, those things don't really amount to much. Our directions and our thoughts and our emotions need to line up to the Word of God. Because it's very easy for us to follow all kinds of fads. Even in the Christian world. Have you seen this? In the Christian world, there are fads that come. And they're not always godly fads. Uh, we see in churches today sometimes, uh, people will talk about things that they really like and don't like. You know, based on style or preference. And not that those are bad things, but when it becomes the focus, we lose sight of what matters. When the concern ought to be first all the time... Is Jesus Christ seen and known here? Styles are great, programs are important, but do I know Jesus? Am I able to see him clearly in what we're doing as a church or in my life or in my home? Is he lifted up more than my preferences or my ideas? It's a caution, really, for us to, to not get into that consumerism in the Christian world to, to, because being a Christian is about knowing Jesus. It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ to let him direct our opinions and our preferences and our life. So Simon was destined to fail because he had nothing to provide them that would last. He was eventually going to collapse. And, and, and they were, uh, all he was able to do was bring them to the next greatest thing, the next entertaining thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and they keep returning, wanting for more, buying another ticket for his event, and hopefully able to provide something he could deliver on. Philip had no bag of tricks. He had no hype. 
He came with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that was it. Now look what happens. In verse 12, it says, But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Philip relied on Jesus Christ, boasted in Jesus Christ, and God did a work. We see this a, a, a lot from Simon, uh, that there is this, that he has this bag of tricks, but Philip had something unique, and he preached Christ. There's power in what he preached. Greater than anything Simon could have done was that he preached the gospel, the good news. So significant even that Simon notices. Notice what he, he's like, hey, wait a second. There's something that he's doing that I really need to get because it will help my brand be better. Attention went from Simon to Jesus Christ, which is what should happen, by the way, in ministry. It should not be, hey, look at what the pastor is doing, look what the church is doing. No, look, look who Jesus is. Look what who could, he's doing. We are a Christ-centered church, and that should not surprise you that Christ is the center of what we do. It should be the case. You should see that, experience that. It's not something we just say. It's something that we live. And I pray that way about our church, but about our families, about our lives, that Jesus is first, that we don't get caught up in the minutia of running the machine that is the church, but we realize that everything we do is a call for us to put Jesus first and to let him change lives through the work that he's doing in our midst. There's enough in the gospel to turn hearts to Christ. We don't need anything else. We don't need gimmicks and fancy mirrors and smoke and all those kinds of things. We just, we just need the gospel. And, and, and I was a youth pastor. Years ago, I would joke that if I had pizza and dodgeball every week, we'd get like 100 kids showing up. And there's nothing wrong with pizza and dodgeball. I like both those things. But the point was, if we just get kids to come together and eat pizza, what have we done? Nothing. They need something. We need to give them something. We need to show them the power of Christ. And the same thing for us in our own experience in our own lives. The very best thing we could do for teenagers or for you or for any of us is to give them the gospel, to give them the word of God, because that was going to change lives. No theatrics, no tricks. Jesus is better than any of those tricks anyway because he died and rose again. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation and to everyone who believes, Jew first and also to the Greek. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. People are drawn to Jesus and they want to know him. So what do we have to offer? Well, we have the gospel. Our hearts are made alive in Christ. And when that happens, it just spills out of us. The power of God for salvation spills out of us, and we just want to give it away, don't we? We want to let people know about this. He has changed us. It's the most relevant message there is. Are you living under the gospel? We need it every day. It's not like a one-time deal. We need this every day, every moment of our life. We need to know that Jesus died for us. We need to hear this all the time. We need to be reminded of it in our own spirit that he rose again to give me eternal life. He gave me hope. He gave me grace. And he gives you the same. Do you see him clearly? Without all this stuff, do you admire him, cherish him? Are you letting him have his way in your life? Do you put him as the center of your life. Do you do that? When you do, he takes that center place, he's made known, naturally it happens. So another question then that comes up here in the midst of Simon's fake conversion, as you're looking at the things used to preach the gospel, he's missing the point. He, he's looking at what is being pointed with. Now, John Piper said something like this one time. He said that uh, it describes, like, like when you're trying to point something out, like these, this guy is, you know, and you're, you're pointing at something and they're not seeing it, but they're just seeing your finger, right? They're just seeing your finger. That's what it's like sometimes. We can enjoy maybe a, a sermon. We can go to a worship service. We can experience something and be like, man, that was a great service, and like it was a great sermon, and all these things happen, but we miss what we're pointing at. 
It's wonderful to have all those things, but we need to make sure we are looking at what is being pointed at, not just the finger pointing it, and completely miss Jesus. Simon saw the power. He wanted the power, but he missed the one who gave the power. So don't miss Jesus Christ. Don't miss the person. And that's the response we see, right? The response to this gospel message brings life change. It's not just like, okay, yep, great, we've heard it. No, it it does something in us. In in verse 10, here's the contrast. Simon, they came high and low and gave them their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power. No, it's the great power. They gave Simon all this attention. People responded. People came. They say, wow, look at how great this is. Look at how wonderful. He's such a magician. But it didn't change any lives, did it? You know, I've seen lots of, like, fireworks shows. There was one last weekend here in Battle Lake. I've seen many movies. I've spent a lot of hours driving on the road. I've given my attention to all these things. And guess what? They have not changed my life. It was a good time. They noticed an amazing show. It was really good and attractive. But there was nothing all that life-changing about it until they hear the gospel. In verse 12, then, it says this. They believed Philip and, what does it say? They were baptized. They were changed. They demonstrated the real work of, of conversion, that they said, yes, I believe and I want to be identified with Jesus. My life is, is different. I'm no longer that old person. In verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The people responded to Philip with their heart, and you know what? Such a response took place that the apostles heard about this, and they said, we've got to go and see something that's going on in Samaria. This was really important, by the way, because, like I said, there was this splinter there. Like They were like other and like not really real Jews and all this stuff, and now that they trusted Jesus, there was this unity that came that they were now one in Christ and there was this animosity he needed to go because there was no reason for it anymore. It was a true miracle. But Simon believes intellectually. He's motivated by the need for power. And it says here he wants to buy the Holy Spirit. Well, that's not how it works. (coughs) And Philip tells him, hey, you need to repent of that and believe. Proves as a fair warning for us, doesn't it? To make sure that we embrace Jesus Christ for who he is as the, as the person that he is, that salvation is answered in the person of Jesus Christ. That's our real need. Not the stuff, but the person. A.B. Simpson, founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, I know I've mentioned him quite a bit recently, but he wrote about this, and he wrote a hymn about this whole idea of desiring the gift and not the giver, and that's what often happens. He said, I wish to speak to you about Jesus and Jesus only. I often hear people say, I wish I could get a hold of divine healing, but I can't. Some will say, I've, I've got it. If I ask them, what have they got? They, I've got the blessing. I've got the theory. I've got the, the healing. I've got the sanctification. But he says, but thank God we have been taught that it is not the blessing, it's not the healing, it's not the sanctification, it's not the thing, it's not the it. It is something better. It is the Christ. It is himself. And may we not get so caught up in the stuff that we forget we want him. We need him. And the first part of his hymn, then, is the same hymn called himself. And it's once it was the blessing, once it was the feeling, once it was the gifts, but now the giver. And that's what it's all about. It's never been about the gifts, it's been about the giver. We receive lots of gifts in our life. And I know that if I'd ever have like done this, if I'd ever said to the giver of the gift, like, uh, you know, like, give me the gift, goodbye. You know, like, if you don't... Basically, we love the giver more than the gift. If we love the gift more than the giver, we've messed up. My kids have given me all kinds of things over the years that to the untrained eye don't mean anything, right? But to me, they mean something because they've been given to me by my children whom I love more than the gift. And that's what this is speaking to. It revolves around the cross of Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us. A powerful reminder of the hope that we have 
in Christ. The world around us might crash and burn, but the cross stands. He, <laughs> the things that we build with our hands, we can't trust in those things. In an instant, they might be lost, but the cross tells us that we are with him forever. That there was an, there was an attempt that, of sin to overcome us, and Jesus overcame the sin in our lives, and we can know him and trust him. It says here in Hebrews 4, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us then hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need, to hold firmly to the faith that we profess that Jesus knows what we face and we're allowed to approach God with boldness and receive the grace we need to carry on. The gospel is hope for us. The gospel is the place where God entered into our mess and saved us from that which was trying to overtake and destroy us. No other religion offers those things. No other, no other name is as high as the name of Jesus who is able to do that. It's breathtaking what Jesus has done. So if you responded in your heart to Jesus, coming to Jesus means turning away from that old way of life and embracing him for who he is. There's not an agenda there. It's, hey, take me as I am, as your very own, and change my life. Redirect my thoughts. How clearly do you see Jesus in your own life? To take all that stuff we call Christian living and set it aside and ask the question, how clearly do you see Jesus? The gospel is such a simple message yet so powerful for us. He doesn't, Jesus doesn't come with any fancy tools to change our heart. He gives us himself and he is the one who changes us by his power the most relevant thing you will ever hear for your life. So what's your response to him? Honestly, where is your heart? Do you feel close to him? Is the work of the Holy Spirit obvious in you? Are you weary? Some of you are. Burned out. Burned by others, perhaps. The gospel gives us hope because Jesus is truly all we need. It's not just cliche. It's the reality of it. He is all that we need. He wants to be alive and active and working in you. Will you trust him to do that? Are there those on your heart today who maybe have never trusted Jesus? And that's another part of this, is that we can say, like, how, how, can, how can I represent the power of the gospel in lives around me that have never heard, have never understood? And may, Lord, may the Lord give us wisdom to do that well. And finally, Maybe you have never surrendered. Maybe you've never really paid attention to this. Maybe you never said, you know what, I've been in church, I've heard the message, but I've never really surrendered. And today you can say, yes, I want to trust Jesus. I want to know him for me. I want to live for him in relationship to give him access to your heart. Even the hard stuff. I know we want to hold things back all the time, but guess what? He knows us there anyway. To give him all of it and say, Lord, have your way in me. It might be very painful to deal with some of those things. But to give him your life to know that he is the God who does change us, does give us eternal life. So then let's go before the Lord together and just bring your, ask the question, how, do I, Lord, do I see you? Do I really pay attention to you? Do I really give you my life? Lord, I do pray that you would make it clear in us what it is you'd like for us. We live a busy life. And a lot of things can distract, but Lord, we want to make sure that we don't miss what you're doing. We don't want to miss you. We don't want to get caught up in our own stuff and just forget that we can come to you and you love us and you have given to us change, a life change, a hope that is beyond anything we can ever experience in this life. So we bring our weary hearts, our, our burned out hearts, our, our, our hurts, our, our, our issues, our addictions, our problems, Lord, to you, and we say, Lord, come, have your way. 